This is a production of Cornell University. It's so, so, so chamber flowers like this, I should say, have evolved all over the world. This is weird enough, and it would be worth it if this was the only one. But the, but the thing that, that strikes me as, a, as an evolutionary biologist as really interesting is that, you know, Southeast Asia has these, and the genus Amorphophallus, as Paul knows, is found across the African tropics as well as the Asian tropics. So it's a large genus that's gotten around. But there's also Aristolochias. Okay, this is a very ancient group of vines, 200, 300 species of them around the world. They're very ancient in pan-tropical distribution. They make trap flowers also. They just hang them up in trees. They look like pieces of dead meat. They're not appealing, but they're fantastic. Okay, and they also trap their pollinators. Um, the other plants in the, uh, uh, in the skunk cabbage family that you're familiar with all form trap flowers. Okay, there are some really funky uh, milkweeds from South Africa, including hoodia, the plant that several of you know as a kind of appetite suppressant, um, you know, uh, growth industry. These are succulents that look like cacti, but they're actually milkweeds. You know, so, so the compounds that, that we studied last time um, in this plant that we were able to identify using, you know, analytical chemistry are actually relatively simple. I'll, I'll pass this around and you can look at it. This is a time course with clocks to show you what time of day we were collecting scent. And then I've basically tracked five molecules in here, um, ones that are highly indicative of carry-on mimicry or dung mimicry in plants. And the point I wanted to make was that this happens around the world. Every continent has a carrion flower. They're just not always this big, okay? But what they're tapping into with volatile sulfides, with phenol and cresol and indole, things that you smell in, in, in feces of dogs or cats or, 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 or herbivores like cows and horses, um, those are universal signals, or cues rather, they, that are highly reliable indicators of the presence of rotting meat or of feces. And so all across the planet, there are animals that use those resources, as distasteful as they are to us, as places to lay their eggs and grow their young. Okay? And so those guys are trapped. We call it a sensory trap. For them to be good mothers, blowflies have to find rotting meat or feces. They have to find it at just the right time before the yeasts and molds take it over, um, and not too early so that it's not ready to be digested yet by their, their grubs and maggots. So that's why forensic entomologists are so important, that they, they can track you know, how long a body has been dead by you know, the stage of development of the blowfly larvae, because the females always make the right choice as to when exactly to lay the eggs. And at that exact moment, there's a signature of heat, of carbon dioxide, and these five molecules I'm gonna show you. Um, and those are her template. That's how females choose. The plants have, have picked that lock. They've broken the code, okay? And what, what Paul will show you is that, you know, these plants, whether they're in the poinsettia family, whether they're in the aristolochia family, whether they're in the, the arum family, whether they're in the milkweed family, they've all converged on the same chemistry. Now, there's other aspects of these that are really interesting. Why are they blotchy, red, patches of red and green? Why are some of them really hairy? I mean, you can speculate as to, you know, a really choosy blowfly female would want you know, a hairy dead body to, to oviposit into, right? And a lot of these flowers are chambers with holes, just as an orifice, like an ear, would be a great place to lay eggs in a dead body if you were a blowfly female or a burying beetle or something, okay? But, but beyond the gothic horror of this, what's really interesting is that it's a way of life, okay? There's a, the decomposers of the planet that keep, that keep the ecosystem cycling use cues, chemical cues like this to make their choices. And what these plants are doing is they're code breakers, okay? They've found a code that can't be faked, except they're faking it. And the pollinators have to come because if they ignore chemistry that good, they're gonna miss out potentially. That it's not a cognitive choice they're making, but, but they have been selected to respond to big dead meat. And that's what this is. This is a dead elephant, okay? <laughs> that's the way we see it at the moment. Now, there's other
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.